getting hard, money's getting skeezed. Soon as I get them, my cotton tongue, bound to meet his please. Hello. Welcome to the Williamson County Public Library the Thelma Battle African American Exhibit 2015. This year's title is Coming and Going. I would like to read to you an uh, introduction. The title of this year's 2015 exhibit, Coming and Going, is an African American adage. It addresses the migration patterns of African-American families or individuals leaving their home for other places. The purpose of this brief presentation is to document local Williamson County, Tennessee, African-American history. Some earlier local African-Americans relocated by going from the rural areas and heading for segregated communities such as Hard Bargain and the Natchez Street area homes within Williamson County. Other local African Americans relocated outside of the county and state for various reasons, all of which will be addressed in this exhibit. And over a period of time, some African Americans left their homes in various places outside of the state of Tennessee by relocating and coming here to make their homes in Williamson County. The word migration should not be an unfamiliar word in local African American history. African Americans were constantly bought, sold, and transported and forced to live in places not of their choosing. Starting with the Underground Railroad, slaves daringly migrated north at their own choosing. However, the Underground Railroad is not presented in this feature. Won't you join us as we journey into the migration of local African Americans in Williamson County, Tennessee? Photograph number one, Mariah Reddick, born 1832, died 1922. Mariah was given as a gift to Caroline Winder, who married John McGavick. Mariah was a slave. She was brought to Tennessee from Homer, Louisiana, and lived at the Carrington Plantation. During the time of the Civil War, her owner had her sent to Alabama so that she would not be influenced by the Federals who were coming through. After uh, the war, she came back and she brought back a husband, Bowling Reddick. And Caroline and John McGavick uh, made sure that uh, Mariah was taken care of. Mariah eventually had a home on uh, Columbia Avenue, a very large home on Columbia Avenue. Uh, when she died in 1922, the Franklin newspaper wrote the following at the time of her death. This fine old character has hardly an equal left among her race in this town. She was so well thought of by the black and white of this community. Photograph number two is Bowling Reddick. He was the husband of Mariah and he came up from of uh, Mississippi with Mariah. Photograph number three, Mariah Reddick in her older years. A Franklin newspaper reported the following excerpts. The passing of Mariah Bell Reddick at her home on Columbia Avenue last Friday night removes from Franklin one of the oldest citizens and also a historical character that has been closely connected with prominent and leading events in the South. 
Little Negro blood flowed in her veins. She was half Indian with a possible strain of French blood, hence the strong, clear mentality and a combination of characteristics marked and unusual. And that was the thinking during that time of an African American who showed higher intelligence than the average slave. Photograph number four, Mariah Bell Reddick and her husband. Photograph number five, former home of John Watt Reddick. The large home was once located in the vicinity of where the Dairy Queen and the Kentucky Fried Chicken establishments later arose on Columbia Avenue. And those of you viewers who are not familiar with Kentucky Fried being on Columbia Avenue, it was in the vicinity across from where the uh, Piggly Wiggly and the Mapco uh, stations are. The uh, child standing on the porch is Mariah's granddaughter, Thelma Reddick King. Photograph number six, Della Reddick, born 1880, died 1929. Della was the wife of John Watt Reddick, and she's pictured here with an unidentified friend. Della was the daughter of D.K. and Labonia Johnson of Alabama. Photograph number seven is John Watt Reddick. He was born in 18... 40, and he died in 1941. Uh, John was the son of Mariah Reddick and Bowling Reddick. John was a respected citizen of Franklin. He and his wife Della and four children, Ellen, Luther, Mar Marie, and Thelma, once owned a large home on Columbia Avenue. John held a position as LNN Railroad mail clerk. He was a mail clerk on the train between Nashville, Tennessee, and Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Reddick also fought in the Spanish-American War where he was a marksman. For that reason, in later years, everybody wanted to go hunting with him. He was the Tennessee Grand Master of the Mosaic Templars and a leader in the free and accept, accepted Masonic Lodge, Olive Branch Number no. 7 of Franklin, Tennessee. Photograph number no. 8 is Thelma Reddick King and her son, William DeMonte King, former Franklin resident. Thelma was the daughter of John Watt and Della Reddick. Thelma attended the Talladega College in Talladega, Alabama. She migrated to New York City where she did secretarial work. She married twice, first husband Walter Payton of New York City, and her second husband was George Keene of New York City, Panama, and Jamaica. Photograph number nine is Luther Reddick, son of John Watt and Della Reddick. And Luther was a native of Franklin, and he attended Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. Photograph number 10, William Damani King, great-grandson of Mariah and Bowling Reddick. He was the son of Thelma Reddick. William never lived in Franklin, Tennessee, but lived in New York before making his perma permanent home in the Republic of Panama. He was honored with the position of being on the Board of Regents at Howard University last year in 2014. He was honored by three local organizations uh, last year as well, and those organizations was the Heritage Society, the Historical Society, and the African American Heritage Society. The photograph number 11 is two written pages on the life of Mariah Reddick and her family. 
as we go to the second floor exhibit, we will view the Dotson family. Photograph number 12 is Oscar Dotson, son of Walter Dotson and Ella Buford Dotson of the Paytonville Road in Williamson County, Tennessee. Uh, Dotson graduated from Franklin Training School, but he migrated to Detroit, Michigan soon after graduating from high school. He married soon afterwards and raised a family, but he was employed at the Ford Motor Company in Michigan at an early age. According to his niece, Martha Dotson Cartwright, he was a Ford man all the way. From the time he went to Detroit until he retired, he was a Ford man. When he retired in 1974, he came back home to Tennessee. His wife had died. He came back home to the family farm to help his sister, Cece, upgrade the family farm. He upgraded the family farm tremendously. He stayed for several years until his health failed and he returned to Michigan where his grown children saw to his care. Uh, he made extensions to the family home, adding on to a bedroom and a bathroom for himself. The county was putting in water lines in the neighborhood about that time, and he negotiated with his cousin, Jesse Dotson Sr., to help run the pipes across his property to the family home. Martha, his niece, has said, we had been using well water until he came back. The Dotson Road was upgraded by him. He negotiated with his cousin, Jesse Dotson Sr., for extra land by moving his fence line to make a better road to the family home. Uh, according to his niece, the county keeps the road up now. She said the family had been crossing the creek in their cars. The road was just a wagon road, and when it rained a little bit, she said we were stranded. She told me, he built a bridge, honey. He built a bridge, he put a bridge up there that a tank can cross. He paid someone to help haul concrete, and he hauled scrap metal and drew his own plans and everything for that bridge. Martha also told me, she says, I was a senior at Bethesda High School, and he had me take the plans to school for my shop teacher to see how much weight it looked like the bridge could hold up. My shop teacher said, as a shop teacher, he was no expert, but the plans looked like the bridge could hold up a tank. Martha's uncle, uh, later told her that I don't need an expert. I just wanted his opinion. He was very active in his church, and when he came home to Tennessee, he went to his mother's church, Connection Hill Primitive Baptist Church in Thompson Station, and he became an usher, attended Sunday school, Bible school, picked up people in town, and carried them to church at Connection Hill. That to me is a wonderful story and a piece of history that very few people would have known and it uh, enhances the, the f family legacy and the young people have something to, to, to look back on with much pride to know that they had an ancestor who migrated north for a better life and then came back and shared what he had to make life better for the family down on the farm. So that's what the migration uh, that we at the library are attempting to express to you this year. Uh, photograph number 13 is Carol C.C. Dotson. Carolyn was her name, but she was known to many of us as Miss Cece. She graduated from Franklin Training School in 1946, and she's on the first row, third from left. Also shown on th this photograph with her uh, classmates are Charles 
W. Amos. Uh, that's on the front row, left to right. Charles W. Amos, Calvin Douglas, C. C. Dotson, Mary Johnson Mills, Mrs. Mills, County Com ex County Commissioner and School Principal and Educator. Uh, Samuel Andrew Scruggs, Aaron Douglas, second row, M Miriam W. Wainwright, Catherine Elizabeth Smith, Dorothy A. Bright, Molly K. Burns, Rena M. Ellison, Laura R. King, Tiny Neville Sanford, Juanita Swanson, and Professor T.J. Miles. And a lot of you have heard about the Prox Amateur. Well, this photograph is of Professor T.J. Miles, whose nickname was Prox. Photograph number 14 is Ella Presley Buford Dotson. She is shown with a bucket on her head and, and one in each hand. This is a spillover from the African uh, way of, of being productive and, and handling a situation without uh, making too many trips. <laughs> uh, Ella Presley died in 1959. She was the daughter of uh, Albert Presley and his second wife, Susie Buford Presley. Ella was born near Thompson Station on the plantation of Buck Buford, a white man. Her parents, Abbott and Susie Presley, were tenants on the Buck Buford Plantation, which adjoined the Sam Pointer Plantation. Ella married Walter Dotson and lived on the Dotson farm on Paytonville Road. Photograph number 15. Thompson Station Natives. This is a, a photograph of a few generations of the Dotson family. Oscar Dotson Sr., son of Walter Dotson Sr., Oscar Dotson Jr., Walter Dotson Sr., and the small boy is James Bubba Dotson, son of Oscar Dotson Jr. Photograph number 16 is Francis Dotson a graduate of Franklin Training School and a scholar at Tennessee State University. She died of tuberculosis shortly after graduation from Tennessee State University. Photograph number 17, the Dotson brothers, Luther, uh, born in 1917, died in 1993, and his brother, Jesse Dotson Sr. Uh, they originally owned a farm in Williamson County on the hop of Paytonville Road uh, in Thompson Station. The farm was named as the Century Farm until a few years ago when it was uh, parts of it uh, was sold. Uh, the cover photograph is Oscar Dotson family who migrated to Kansas. He's shown with his first wife, Lizzie, and, and uh, his children. As we journey upstairs to the other element of this exhibit, we see photograph number 19, the fate of slaves belonging to Samuel Winstead. Samuel Winstead was a slave owner who died in 1851. He had written in his will that he wanted his slaves liberated and sent to Liberia. But because of family influences, this never took place and the court, the courts of Williamson County delayed uh, this. He left $26,000 for his slaves in order for them to travel to Liberia and get established once they got there. Uh, when the smoke cleared with the court cases, the most that each one of the descendants of these slaves got was about 300 and something dollars. Uh, the next uh, exhibit is of 
the Henry Bateman will. He also willed that his slaves uh, would be sent to Liberia, and this is a list of his slaves. Photograph number 22, the fate of the slaves belonging to Samuel Winstead. The resurgence of African-American colonization in the 1850s saw one local Williamson County, Tennessee slave owner, Samuel Winstead, born 1778, died 1851, leave a will that left finances and safe passage to his slaves. The will written by Samuel Winstead left present-day historian and author Rick Warwick to write the following. One of the most complex and difficult wills of antebellum Williamson County was that of Samuel Winstead, who lived at Winstead Hill on Columbia Pike. Samuel Winstead was married to Susanna Smith and had no issue. He had no children. It is unknown if the idea of sending his slaves to Liberia after the death of his wife and bequeathing to them part of his estate was based on religious reasons or social conscience. His sister Lucy Ann Winstead had attempted to emancipate her slaves in 1835, but was discouraged by law and Samuel's unwillingness to post security. After Samuel's death, Susanna married Jeremiah Stevenson, and he died leaving him, and she died leaving him her interest in her brother's estate. Questions arose with Samuel's nieces and nephews as to what monies were used for the upkeep of the slaves and what should be done with the monies realized from their hiring out. The case reached the Tennessee Supreme Court. After many years in local court, due to the advent of the Civil War and their eventual emancipation, the slaves were never sent to Liberia. They eventually shared a share of Samuel's estate, approximately $364 each. Because of the minor children and disabled interested parties, lawyers, guardians, and court appointees had a feast stretching the case until the year 1916. Photograph number 23, the fate of the slaves belonging to Samuel Winstead. And what you are seeing is portion of Samuel Winston's will and the codicil to his will. Photograph number 24, the Tennessee Supreme Court ruled on March the 10th, 1870. Closure and justice came to the former slaves. All those years, closure and justice came to the former slaves. Shown is a listing of slaves at that date. Photograph number 25 is a map of Liberia showing Greenville County, Sino, Liberia, and the designation of the emancipated slaves. Now these were the designation of the Reverend Thomas Douglas slaves. He also had a will and wanted his slaves to be sent to Liberia, and they did make it. The names of the emancipated slaves were Cupid, Dinah, Peter, Aaron, Manuel, Elijah, Alcy, Lucinda, Lucinda's children, Joda, Aaron, Mary, and Lucy. They all belonged to Thomas Douglas of Williamson County, Tennessee. According to historian Rick Warwick, Christian conscious in the 1840s and the 1850s resulted in the formation of the colonization of the liberation movement. The returning to Africa of liberated slaves proved expensive and difficult. 
The following is an excerpt from an 1854 letter to Dr. Thomas Henderson, who was a friend of Thomas uh, Douglas. Uh, this this uh, letter came from one of the slaves who was sent, and it was written by Elvin, and he wrote, we have drawn our lands 15 miles from town. Now this is in uh, Greenville County, Liberia. Uh, my wife and myself drawed seven acres. Lucinda and her children drawed eight acres. Four other men drawed five acres each. And that was the language that Elvin uh, had written this letter, and that's the, the language that I'm reading it to you. And he said, Josie drawed nothing on account of his age. The judges gave us a good, as good a land as there is in Sino. I have found an excellent iron ore on my land and reported it. So the good fortune that uh, came upon these particular uh, slaves who did make it to Liberia. Can you imagine being able to find iron ore on your farm and how uh, independent and productive uh, Elvin's family uh, were bound to have become? We would like to know if there are anybody in Williamson County who may be related to Elvin Douglas, who left Williamson County in 1854 and, and went to Liberia. Photograph number 26, the fate of slaves belonging to Samuel Winstead. Uh, we're looking at Reverend Allen Winstead. He was the son of Allen and Josephine Winstead. Allen Winstead and his brother Luke Winstead as young men learned the concrete trade. Uh, Allen learned to be a first class concrete contractor and during early years when there were no machines available, Allen Winstead and a crew of all black men hand mixed on the streets of Franklin the necessary concrete to build most of the sidewalks in downtown Franklin. Now this uh, report was given by the late Reverend William Scruggs, and he himself was a contractor. Uh, Reverend Scruggs also uh, had said he used horse-drawn wagons to haul materials from the Rock Crusher to Franklin and all parts of town. Buildings like the Lilly Mill Company and the J.M. King Garage, the Craig Lumber Company, S.C. Farnsworth Company and the United States Post Office were some of the landmarks that he did concrete work on. He pastored the following churches, Linville, Centerville, Locust Ridge, and built the church at Centerville. Photograph number 27 is Noble Winstead, born in 1880, died in 1972. He was a Franklin native and a World War I veteran. Winstead was a descendant of Steph Winstead, which was uh, named on the Samuel Winstead slave list as Stephanie uh, Winstead. Uh, Stephanie was des destined to Liberia, but he never made it. Noble Winstead was a former ice house employee. His occupation later changed to carpentry in the industry of building construction. Winstead married three times, for Fanny Ewan in 1910, Maddie Odie in 1927, and Johnny Wooldridge in 1938. The photograph 28 is the form of home of Noble and Johnny Winstead. The home is presently owned by the Scruggs family, and the home is located on the corner of Natchez Street and 11th Avenue South. Photograph number 29, the fate of the slaves belonging to Samuel Winstead. Once again, we have a descendant of Stephanie. Step was his nickname, Winstead. 
He was one of the male slaves owned by Samuel Winstead. Uh, William Fatpappy Radcliffe is shown with the 1956 championship football team. The team was officially named champions of the Western Division of the Middle Tennessee Athletic Association, and that was a segregated association because that was took place during segregated times. This was the first time in the school's history that the Panthers had won the championship of the Western Division. They were undefeated for the season. Franklin Training School was named School of the Year, and Coach Sylvester Dunn was named Coach of the Year. Photograph number 30, the, the fate of slaves belonging to Samuel Winstead. We have Thelma Jean Radcliffe, a descendant of Steph Winstead. Uh, she was pictured in the 1949-50 yearbook at Franklin Training School, where she was a cheerleader. Shown left to right is Louise Brown, who was the captain, Thelma Jean Radcliffe, Sarah Stevens, Walter Mac Amos, who's now known as Reverend Walter Amos of the Franklin Primitive Baptist Church on Hard Bargain, Jesse Cornelia Patton, who later married uh, Skeet Esman and Mary A. Patton. Photograph number 31. The, we're shown with, once again, William Fat Pappy Radcliffe, a descendant of Steph Winstead. And uh, he's pictured here uh, playing a summer ball game with the Ast Astros. And Steph Winstead married a few times. Uh, 1870 marriage license uh, says he married Margaret Matthews on October the 7th, 1870. And prior to this marriage, Steph Winstead was married to Amelia, who was known as Melia. And after that, he was married to Nellie Porter in 1893. Photograph number 32, the fate of four ex-slaves who joined the Union Navy. They mustered out in Mississippi, according to a film that was given to me as a gift by the young uh, students from Murfreesboro, Illinois, who started this uh, re research on the Bostic slaves. The, the brothers were Stephen Harding Dudley and William J. Bostic. Stephen Bostic was born in Williamson County, Tennessee. He was a former Union Navy man who mustered into the Navy in Mississippi. His father was Washington Bostic, who was born in 1808 in Tennessee. Nothing is known about uh, Stephen's mother except that her name was Charlotte and she was born in Tennessee. Unlike many slaves, Bostic could read and write. Bostic enrolled in the Union Navy on the first day of January 1863 and was assigned to the General Bragg, a steamer during the Civil War. The General Bragg was a side wheel steamer, was built in 1851. It, made, it weighed 1,043 tons and its dimensions were 208 feet long and 32 feet wide and 12 feet high. The Confederacy stole the ship early in the war along with 13 boats. The rebels planted the bows with iron and protected their machinery with cotton. When Flag Officer Foote bombarded Fort Pillow with motorboats, the Bragg surprised motorboat Cincinnati and rammed her, but not before receiving a full broadside from her and sinking in 11 feet of water. The Bragg was recovered and added to the Federal fleet. It was sold in 1865. 
at uh, some point after his discharge, Bostick went to Hamilton, Ohio, where in uh, November 1864, he received his first pension. Uh, on the third day of January 1866, Bostick appeared in Hamilton County Court to have his pension transferred to Murfreesboro, Illinois, where he had moved. Now, Murfreesboro, Illinois was an all-black town that these Bostick brothers had helped to establish. It had a school, a cemetery, somewhat like where they had originated from in Tennessee, Triune, Tennessee, which had the cemetery, the school, and the church. Uh, Stephen Bostick married Cheney Woods in 1869, and uh, she, she was born in Williamson County also. Her parents were Charlie and Eveline Hyde Wood, and they also were born in Tennessee. Uh, Stephen Bostick was wounded in the battle uh, at Louisiana on uh, June 15, 1864. A musket ball entered his forearm, continued through his shoulder, and completely disabled his arm. He transferred to the hospital ship Piccany on June 25, 1864, and was medically discharged from the Navy on November the 15th, 1864. Photograph number 34, Locke Oden. He was a former Civil War soldier born in Williamson County, Tennessee, but migrated to Topeka, Kansas after the war. Paulette Johnson, a descendant of the Oden family of Williamson County, is inquisitive if he might be related to her family, inquiring mind, want to know. Perhaps you viewers might have a clue to this mystery. Photograph number 35, Lucy A. Redmond, ex-slave and daughter of Peggy Jane Redmond, an ex-slave, once owned by Y.W. Redmond. Now Peggy's migratory record was self-explained in a Williamson County court deposition these are her words. He bought me in Virginia a good many years ago. He then took me to Mississippi to sail, but could not get as much as he had asked, and he brought me back to Tennessee. I came up the Tom Bigby River through Alabama by way of Gainesville, Tennessee. So for a, ex for a slave to I have actually left this record of their migratory uh, steps is uh, very rare. And for the Redmond family to have this documented, it uh, is an exception. Lucy Redmond was one of five children fathered by a white man named Ben Redmond of Triune, Tennessee, in Holmes County. Yazoo, Mississippi. Peggy Jane and her children inherited a substantial amount of land from their owners, which was finally settled in lawsuits. One particular farm in inherited by her family was on the site of the present-day Sturbridge Point subdivision located on the Murfreesboro Pike. Photograph 36 is Dr. Y. E. Redmond, son of Lucy Redmond, uh, and he was the dentist who migrated to Arkansas and later came back to Tennessee. He's shown in this photograph with Maggie Bessie Prince, who was a funeral home uh, operator at uh, that particular time. Uh, the Prince Funeral Homes uh, still stands on the corner of Park Street and 11th Avenue, and it's uh, presently owned by Tracy Beach. Uh, photograph number 37 are the grandsons of Peggy Jane Redmond, ex-slave. Uh, left to right, there's Tom Redmond, William B. Redmond, 
and Fred Redmond. Tom Redmond was an entrepreneur. Uh, he, he was known to have owned pinball machines and he was in charge of the concession stand at Hadley Park for a number of years. All of the equipment there as well as the concession stand equipment was owned by Tom Redmond. William B. Redmond was a businessman and he was a proprietor on Main Street and still worked out of the original building that his grandfather, A.N.C. Williams, uh, had had his business establishment. Uh, the other brother, Fred Redmond, was a beautician. It was known back then as a beautician, but today we say cosmetologist, and he had his own beauty shop on the corner of Ninth Avenue and Natchez Street, Ninth Avenue South and Natchez Street. Uh, photograph number 38 is uh, Albinda Williams Redmond, the wife of W.B. Redmond, who was a son of Lucy Redmond. And Albinda was the daughter of Reverend A.N.C. Williams, uh, an ex-slave and a former Main Street merchant. And she is shown with her grandson, William B. Redmond III, in this photograph. Photograph number 39 is Tommy Ella May, ex-slave of Samuel Fern Perkins of the Westview Plantation of Triune. This plantation no longer stands. It was, uh, it was burned several years ago. Tommy Ella was fortunate enough to migrate to Utah and California. It was often said by her relatives that they believed she, when she traveled, she passed herself off as a white woman so she could travel in better accommodations. Uh, photograph number 40, Tommy Ella May, who once belonged to Samuel Fern Perkins. And once again, it talks about her migration to Utah and California. Photograph 41 uh, is the will of Samuel uh, Perkins. He willed uh, Tommy Ella May $1,500 in his will, which was an, an exceptional amount of money during that time to uh, will to an African-American person. Uh, photograph number 42 is the uh, information on the migrants to Kansas from Williamson County, Tennessee. Uh, there was a newspaper clipping where several African Americans left Williamson County in 1876 and uh, they w migrated to Kansas and one of them was one of the Crump brothers and he got the, the the group got so far and they ran out of money, but Mr. Crump was fortunate enough to have a brother back here who went up there and carried him money so that he could travel travel further. Uh, photograph 43 is information announcing the ex-slaves migrating uh, to Kansas. Number 44 is the St. Louis school where Crump's uh, granddaughter, Hazel, taught. Uh, the fact that they started out for Kansas and ended up in St. Louis uh, did not dampen their zeal for trying to get away and do a, have a better life. And the fact that Hazel was able to teach school at this building that you're looking at and when they had migrated uh, there in 1876 says a lot for itself. Uh, photograph uh, 45 is the B Baker family from Marshall County, Tennessee, who part of their family migrated here to Williamson County. Uh, Mrs. Minerva Owens Bright, who was deceased, 
uh, kept a trunk of, of mementos and letters, and her daughter uh, shared with us a letter from th one of the relatives who had, had uh, gone to Topeka, Kansas in 1879. The letter that Robert Baker wrote to his brother, January 31st, 1902. My dear brother, I received your letter some time ago and now take pleasure to answer it. I thought you never was going to write to me anymore. I am glad you are doing so well. I am sure you are beating me. This last past year was a failure on crops. We didn't make hardly anything in the crop line. I didn't make hardly enough corn to feed my two horses. I have this two, I have the two of the finest horses in the country. Work is dull here for men who got beat in the city election. My man got in one year, so I got two months on the street working with my team. I make about $11 a month. The rest of the time, I have to catch a job here and there. I guess we will have very fair wheat in Kansas this year. We have a good deal of snow fall. It is about six inches deep now and still snowing. It was thought that wheat would be a failure here again this year on account of the rain and snow. But now we have such a big snow when it melt, it will soak the ground good. Old Uncle Major Reynolds, who used to live there on the old Reynolds place, died in Oklahoma Sunday and was brought to Topeka and buried Tuesday. Aunt Ann Wallace died in the last day in the old year. Everything is awful high here. We are all well except myself. I've had an awful bad cold, but I am better now. Sister Mary and Jenny are very well. Jenny, you know that she lost her boy last July. He was a smart, active boy. He hustled around to make her a living. He was only 13 years old. It seemed like she never will get over the death of him. Hope you and, and, and Melvin are well. Write soon, your brother, Robert Baker. This was written in long hand, so if I kind of struggle reading this, it was still a joy to be able to write of the achievements of this family who had left their home in Tennessee. Photograph number 47, Jane Owen Murdick, born 1922, died 1983, daughter of Roy and Airy Baker Owen. She was a Franklin relative of letter writer Robert Baker, who migrated to Topeka, Kansas in 1879. Jane was married to Tuskegee Airman Robert Bob Murdick, uh, born in 1916 and died in 1974. He was also the father of, of uh, Tom Murdick, who was once the president of the African American Heritage Society. Photograph number 48 are the Owen siblings, uh, relatives of Robert Baker, a migrant to Topeka, Kansas. Photograph number 49, Nellie Shaw, who was also known as Grandma. Her descendants had quite a track record of migration. Uh, the descendants of uh, Walter Fernand West uh, migrated to Williamson County, Tennessee, and they were 
descended from Nelly Shaw, an ex-slave and former Na Nashvillian. Uh, Grandma, as she was called, was once owned by Colonel Bob Allen. Allen owned a plantation near Carthage, Tennessee. A Nashville newspaper clipping, date unknown, reported Grandma Nellie Shaw recollections. Colonel Bob Allen was a colonel in Washington's army, and when the nation's capital was moved from Philadelphia to Washington, he was elected to Congress. Colonel Bob, she said, took her as an infant and raised her in his family. Her mother having died, it was unique the way that he obtained, that she obtained what is now regarded as an unusual education for one of, that t of her time. When Colonel Allen's daughter returned from school, Grandma was taught the very thing which the Allen girl had learned, and there were daily after school recitations by the Allen fireside. The flight of her memory swept back to the days when Martin Van Buren was President of the United States in 1836, and having seen the soldiers marching off from her own plantation to the war, what a story this old lady had to tell. Uh, photograph 50 is Frankie Pierce, who was the granddaughter of Grandma Shaw. Frankie Pierce's cousin was Bernice West Brown, daughter of Ferdinand Walter West and Francis Halfacre West. And Bernice Brown was the wife of Colvin Brown. She was the mother of four children, Philip, Christopher, Amy and Emily, who were twins. N Nellie's, uh, Grandma Nellie's grandchildren included the following. Uh, Frankie Pierce, that's shown. Frankie was the head of the vocational training school for colored girls on Heflin Street. And it is noted that Frankie Pierce spoke in Franklin, Tennessee on Natchez Street at the Franklin Training School in 1936 at the graduation exercise of her cousin, the Bernice uh, West, who later became Bernice Brown. Bernice West was the valedictorian of her class in 1936 in Franklin. Uh, grandma's other grandchildren were uh, a w. T. Francis. Uh, grand, her daughter was the wife of W. T. Francis of St. Paul, Minnesota, who caused the Minnesota State Legislature to enact its first anti-lynching bill. What a legacy within the family. And one of Grandma's grandsons, Dr. Lightfoot West, was a surgeon of Mercy Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Another grandson, Dr. T.G. West, was a staff member of Hubbard Hospital and an instructor at the Meharry Medical College there. Another grandson, John West, was an Indian tailor, a West Indian tailor, and a granddaughter, Lula Chapman, uh, migrated to St. Paul, Minnesota, so this family had a wide range of migration. Photograph 51 is the Brown twins, Amy and Emily, and their brothers, Philip and Christopher. Uh, present Franklin resident, Emily Brown, and her sister, Amy Brown Calloway of Georgia, are descendants of Nellie Shaw. Emily Brown was the Williamson County Magistrate in 1974, and the twins were 1976 graduates of Vanderbilt University and studied abroad at Oxford University. They are the children of Coma and Bernice West Brown, who are both deceased. The Brown family's migration to Williamson County on the west side began with their great grand father, Ferdinand Walter West. His, his father, 
was an architect. Uh, Emily Brown relates that her great grandfather once owned a cat casket company on the site of the present Five Points uh, post office. West and his family lived in Little Rock, Arkansas for a time, and his wife was raised by Betty Johnson Dubison, a Franklin native and an aunt of the late Samuel Lee Johnson. Uh, Betty Johnson's Dubison son uh, owned a funeral home in Little Rock, and she migrated there to live with him and his family. Photograph uh, 52 uh, is the marriage certificate of Charles Halfacre and his wife Amanda, whose nickname was Mandy Pointer Halfacre. They migrated from Tennessee to Alabama and then to Mexico. Photograph 53 is a flyer of the advertisement for Negro workers to go to Mexico. The flyer told of the wonderful job opportunities and the living condition, wonderful housing, a uh, chance to raise your own crops and good food. This, however, was false advertisement. Photograph 54 is the map showing the location in Mexico where Charles and Mandy Halfacre sought work. Uh, photograph 55, the colonization of Negroes in Mexico. The Charles Halfacre family is among those shown on this partial listing. Now, several people, hundreds of people, answer this advertisement. The company in Mexico sent representatives to Alabama and Georgia seeking Negroes to come and work on these farms or plantations. But once they arrived there, they found that it was false advertisement. The living conditions was horrendous. Uh, several of these uh, families began to get sick. There was poor water, poor food condition, living conditions, and the heat. There was such poor housing that they could not uh, stand the, the heat and the crops uh, that had been advertised that was not sold, so they had very little food to eat. Charles and uh, his wife Mandy actually died of typhoid fever while they were in Mexico. So many people were sick and wanting to come home that someone had to write to the President of the United States to make arrangements for these poor displaced people to be able to come back. The state of Alabama's governor uh, sent word to the trains that they could not stop there even though the people were citizens of Alabama and they wanted to come back home the trains were not allowed to stop. It went through such red tape that what these people trying to migrate somewhere for a better living to escape, they ran into an even greater disaster. Uh, photograph 56 are the descendants of Charles and Mandy Halfacre, who uh, once again, Charles and his wife had migrated from Williamson County went to Alabama and lived and answered the ad to get the job in Mexico. Uh, photograph 57, another descendant of Charles and Mandy Halfacre uh, who had gone to Mexico for economic reasons. So it's not always greener on the other side of the fence, but they were desperate and wanting better for their families, so they were willing to take a chance, which did not pan out for them. Photograph 58, the Shorter Chapel AME Church. Uh, Shorter Chapel AME Church was once located near the corner of 
uh, Second Avenue and Church Street. It uh, was a large two-story building that had once been owned by a white congregation, and later it was used as a hospital for the uh, wounded in, during the Civil War. Um, the John Deere Company sent representatives to Tennessee and actually to the church looking for blacks to come to Missouri to, to work. The Ewan brothers were members of this church and three of them answered the ad and they went to uh, Missouri. Uh, they were Sylvester, Alvin, and Rice. They were the brothers of Harvey D. Ewan, a prominent carpenter and contractor and trustee of the local Masonic uh, order of Franklin. Photograph 59, uh, some of the uh, congregation migrated to Missouri to work at the John Deere Company, former Shorter Chapel AME Church. The parsonage is shown on the left of this photograph. And photograph 60 is Harvey Ewan. He was a brother of the three who went to Missouri. Uh, photograph 61 is the home of Harvey Ewan, which was located on the Hard Bargain community on Glass Street. Uh, he built this home himself, and if you notice, as you look at the, the workmanship of the side porch and the dormer at the roof and the concrete uh, rock fence, he was a man of prominence for his time. Uh, photograph 62, we have foundry perceptions. I have uh, an excerpt from an interview with Bill Gosey, who was a, a young lad during the time that the uh, Allen Company, which was the foundry, was built. And uh, he wrote, uh, when the foundry first opened here, there wasn't too many blacks working at the foundry. At first, blacks weren't interested in that kind of work because they hadn't been used to that kind of work. So the blacks were coming up from Alabama to work. Also, men were getting out of the penitentiary and working here because the ones from the penitentiary already knew the work. I recalled a foot flow of molder, which was the big part of the stove. The molder workers made a little more money and the iron carriers made a little more money than the common laborers. Now that was Bill Gose's uh, 1920s memory of the foundry and its employees. Uh, another perception is from Susan Hodgson, who was working on her uh, thesis at the time in 1939, and she wrote, it is strange to find an iron working plant, a foundry, in the midst of fertile agricultural lands so far removed from the source of supplies. Because Williamson County was a fertile agricultural community and it was odd back then to see that type of factory here. Uh, Susan wrote that uh, the principal reasons for relocating it in Franklin were the av availability of satisfactory labor supply in which strikes and other labor troubles were practically unknown. The workers in Franklin were so glad to get a uh, employment that uh, they knew nothing about striking and all of that kind of thing, and the price at which the existing plant could be purchased. So they got the, the plant at a very low price. Normally about 500 persons are employed, divided about equally between whites and Negroes. So that gave both races at that time uh, fair employment. Number 63, 
Franklin found your workers. This uh, photograph uh, shows a number of African American men who uh, did that type of labor at the foundry, which was hard and strenuous labor. Uh, one known worker was said to have fallen into the molten uh, uh, iron and, and flesh came from his bones. It was a very tedious and a very hot job, but the money was such an advantage that uh, they withstood that type of work. Uh, shown on this photograph is the father of Henry Turner Moore, uh, who is kneeling the fourth from right. Uh, number 64 is Edward Johnson, who migrated from Alabama to work in the foundry, and he married uh, Blanche uh, Merritt, who uh, was the daughter of a blacksmith here in Franklin, Tennessee. Photograph 65 is Julia Johnson Williams, a uh, Williamson County native, and she married Eugene Williams, another Alabama migrant worker to the foundry. Photograph 66 is Amelia Williams Bradley, who came up from Birmingham, Alabama, raised her brother's son, Sylvester. Sylvester's parents died uh, at a young age. Photograph 67 is Sylvester Williams, Born 1930, died 1999. Sylvester was the son of Eugene Williams and Julia Johnson Williams. He lost both parents at an early age. Sylvester attended Franklin Training School, which is now the Claiborne Hughes Nursing Home. He received his BS and MA degrees at Tennessee State University of Nashville. Williams was employed by the city of Bowling Green, Kentucky, and the Franklin Special School District as a social studies teacher. He was later employed as a loan officer at Williamson County Bank. Williams was a member of Crime Stoppers Association. He was married to Lucille Gentry Williams. The couple had two daughters, Cassandra Pillar and Sonia Williams. Williams and his wife, Lucille, once owned a business establishment on Straw Street, once known as the Williams Snack Bar. The building was rented out later and then sold. Photograph 68 of Clara and Dr. Charles Claudius Johnson. Dr. Johnson was born in Keokuk, Iowa, where he attended the public schools completing his elementary and secondary education. He worked as a mason and also on the Chicago Railroad in order to obtain money to attend medical school. He married Mrs. Johnson during that period of time. He established the Johnson Hospital in Franklin, Tennessee in 1948, where more than 100 babies were born each year. Dr. Johnson played a vital role in the life of the Williamson County in other ways. He was a leader in the civic affairs of the community throughout his career here. His church, Shorter Chapel, African, African American Methodist Episcopal Church received his services as an officer for more than 35 years. He was a member of the Federal Housing Committee and was on the staff of what was then the new Williamson County Hospital. Now this information was copied from the dedication of the Johnson Elementary School in 1959, what I just read to you. Photograph 69 is Charlene Rucker Stevenson. Charlene was born September the 18th, 1945 in Detroit, Michigan. Her mother, Valina Rucker, was a native of Williamson County and reared in the city of Franklin on Cummins Street. Charlene's grandfather was Robert Rucker Sr., a prominent African-American 
in the local bricking industry, uh, instrumental in bricking the Allen Company, now known as the Foundry. And according to an interview I had with the late Bill Gosey, he told me that Robert Rucker was in charge of several black men who did the bricking, and Bill Gosey himself uh, pushed the wheel bars with the bricks. So this was a very interesting history that Charlene Rucker had through her grandfather. Uh, Charlene Stevenson was three days old when her grandmother Florence Rucker brought her to Franklin to live with her grandparents at Rucker Subdivision. She began attending grade school in Williamson County's school system in Thompson Station. A Thompson Station grade school teacher, Beatrice B. Cannon, lived in Rucker Subdivision and carried Charlene to school with her every day. They were neighbors. And Charlene remained attending Thompson Station School until the eighth grade, where she then graduated to the ninth grade at Franklin Training School on Natchez Street. Now, during those early years back in the 1950s, a lot of the African American school teachers who taught school in the country uh, allowed some of the younger children to ride to school with them in order to fulfill the population of the schools in order to keep those schools open. So Charlene was one of those students who participated in that plan. Uh, she finished school at the age of 16 but wasn't allowed to enter college because she wasn't 18 and during that time you had to be 18 in order to go to a college. Uh, that was an age requirement during that time for all college students. So Charlene left Franklin, age of 16, and migrated to Seattle, Washington to live with an aunt who was a beautician, and Charlene too became a beautician, and married and had two children, divorced, and moved to Detroit, Michigan, where she joined a theater group. And she had become interested in acting and took classes and joined an off-Broadway production of Hair in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, she took on the stage name of Michael Brown and the troupe traveled to other cities before playing in Washington, D.C. And then the troupe traveled to London, England and put on several shows. Charlene chose to remain in England with her two daughters, Gail and Sunita Malone, and she can be seen on YouTube. Charlene can be seen on YouTube, Hillsong 10th Anniversary 2010. Photograph number 70, John Bill. John Bill migrated to Detroit to work in an automobile company. He formerly lived in the Westwood community. In 1922, he went north uh, alone and found a place to live and a job and came back and brought his family to Detroit, Michigan. Uh, photograph number 71 is the fate of the John Bill family. Photograph 72, John Bill and wife Cornelia they migrated to Detroit, and uh, during the time that they went to Detroit, they were able to uh, establish a, a rooming house or a boarding house. They uh, enabled other African Americans from Williamson County to come north and have a place to live, get a job, and once they got on their feet, they moved out and someone else came. And so this is what they did to help other people. Photograph 73 is Urias, who was known as Cousin Rye uh, Thompson, and he lived with the Bill family uh, during the time that they were in Detroit. Photograph 74, the John Bill home in Westwood. Uh, during the time of the Depression, the Bill family came back and they built a home with the funds that he had managed to raise from working in the automobile company. 
and uh, standing in the front of this uh, home is Louise Bill Patton and her sister Carrie Bill Morden. Photograph 75, the Bill sisters, daughter of John and Lena Bill. Uh, Louise Patton was born in the Westwood community and her sister Carrie was born in Detroit. Uh, Carrie was double promoted in middle school and went on to graduate from Franklin Training School in 1943 as his valedictorian. Carrie attended a and State University for three years and graduated in 1946 as a certified teacher. Carrie's employment included assistant principal with the Gross Point, Michigan public school system and was a Michigan Education Association representative. Carrie was also owned and operated of her own dress shop, Candy's Import, located on Livernois, the Avenue of Fashion in Detroit from 1967 until 1971. After her retirement from teaching, Carrie ran her own travel agency, the Harvard Travel Square Service of Canton, Michigan, on a full-time basis. Louise Bill Patton attended public school in Detroit as well as Franklin, Tennessee, and graduated as valedictorian of her class at Franklin Training School. She went on to become an educator and taught school in the Franklin Special School District for several years until her retirement. Photograph number 76, uh, Louise Patton and her husband Thomas Gordon Patton. He was a Tuskegee Airman and the son of the Reverend J.T. Patton and Alice Odie Patton. Reverend J.T. Patton was the first African-American funeral director in Williamson County, Tennessee. Uh, photograph 77 is James Morden family vacationing in Mexico. We have Jimmy Morden, Carrie Bill Morden, and their sons Maurice and Michael. Picture 78, James D. Morden, Franklin native and career soldier, migrated from Williamson County after World War II, and his residence included other states as well as Germany and Japan. Uh, photograph 79, James D. Morden, 1924 to 2005. A Williamson County native, m m his migration began with his military career. His military residences included several states, as I said a minute ago, and, and abroad to Germany and Japan. He was the son of James D. Morden, Sr. and Mamie Davis Jackson Morden. Morden joined the United States Army in 1941 at the age of 60, 16. He rapidly rose through the ranks and was promoted to regimental master sergeant by the age of 19. He served with the African American Engineering Unit during World War II. The unit participated in the building of the Alaskan Alkin Highway. Morton later followed and provided logistical support to General MacArthur's triumph return to the Philippine Islands by way of island hopping through New Guinea and numerous other islands. Captain Morton ended his military career in January 1968 at the Suffrage Air Force Base Michigan and immediately thereafter joined Detroit's Bank of Commonwealth as its employment supervisor. Morden crossed over into the bank's branch management operation during the 1970s and during his 24-year banking career he became a regional branch officer, commercial lender and assistant vice president. Commercial Bank acquired Bank of Commonwealth in 1982, and Morden retired from the Commercia in 1992. Morden was married to Carrie Bill Morden, daughter of John and, 
and Lena Bill of Williamson County, Tennessee. They had two sons, Maurice and Michael Morton, who live in Michigan. Photograph 80. We have here a newspaper clipping from Georgia by the Wilkinson County Post, and it's written by Candace Morrow. David L. Moore was Wilkinson County's Mr. Basketball. The 32-year coaching veteran passed away Saturday, September the 27th of natural causes at the age of 75. He started his basketball career in our strong program here in Wilkinson County, Georgia, said Aaron Jeter, superintendent of Wilkinson County Schools and basketball coach. I'm blessed to have known him because he guided my coaching career and served as a board member to hire me as superintendent. He will truly be missed. Moore's basketball legacy included winning 500 games and becoming Georgia's Coach of the Year, 18 out of 32 years. That is saying so much. The Georgia Coach Sports Hall of Fame member also inspired his students and players to work hard in spite of circumstances. He always motivated us to have a winning attitude no matter what, said Richard Chadman. Sheriff of Wilkinson County. He pushed us to never stop seeking what we desired, but we had to be willing to put in the work. Originally from Franklin, Tennessee, Moore was the oldest of 11 children and the first of them to attend college. He was serious about sports and education, said his brother James Moore, 74. He played quarterback and I played in. We had many good times together. He was a role model. Moore earned an associate degree in religious education and theology from Daniel Payne College in Birmingham, Alabama. He also met his wife, Jacqueline, there. The two moved to Wilkinson County, Georgia in 1964 so he could teach. He continued to advance his education, earning a bachelor's degree in physical education from Paul Quinn in Waco, Texas, then a master's degree in administration and supervision from Georgia College. He taught physical education at then Calhoun Consolidated High School in Wilkinson, coaching three state championship teams and state runner-up 11 times. Moore progressed from coaching and teaching to becoming assistant principal and athletic director in the school system. He is survived by his wife, Jacqueline, and three daughters, Lolita, Elizabeth, and Davida. He was a good husband, and his children came first until the grandchildren came along, said Jacqueline who enjoyed 51 years of marriage with David. He cared about people, and if he could, he would go and come back to Wilco again. Uh, photograph 81 is Mamie Davis Morton Jackson, mother of James D. Morton. Photograph 82, the former home of Jack Davis, Davis migrated north to Detroit, Michigan to work in an automobile plant in the 1920s. He returned to Franklin and he and his wife Lou and son James Litton, Lit for short Davis, uh, purchased a home on Natchez Street in 1929 for $800. K.S. Howlett acted as guardian for Litt Davis with stipulations made on the deed. Litt Davis and his wife Lillian Amos Davis resided in this home for many years. The home has since been demolished and replaced with another home. Photograph 83, Mary Elizabeth Davis Harrison McKissick and her niece Patricia Ball Timberlake Leach. Mary Elizabeth was the daughter of Lit Davis and Lillian 
Amos Davis. When she lived in Franklin, she was a member of the First Missionary Baptist Church and sung in the choir. Uh, also shown on this uh, photograph is uh, Patricia, and we uh, often call her Pat, Patricia Ball, and she was the daughter of Charles Ball and James Ella uh, Davis Ball. James Ella was known as Tootie to her friends and Charles was named as Screwloo to his friends. Photograph 84, Joe Frank Hendricks, former Franklin native, migrated to Detroit, Michigan at an early age and worked at the automobile company until he retired. He was the son of Robert Sidney Hendricks and Martha Jordan Hendricks. Photograph 85, John Wallace Owens, 1910 to 1989. He was a Franklin native, son of Louvenia Owens of Franklin. He was, he was married to Marie Rich of Cullioca, Tennessee. John Wallace Owens and his family lived in a large house on Columbia Avenue in Franklin. The house was across the street from Dr. Charles C. Johnson and next door to Ethel Murdoch. John Wallace Owens was employed on Main Street in Franklin at the Gatlin Mechanic Shop before migrating to Pennsylvania. One of his co-workers at that time was Alec Bright, Jr. John Wallace Owens' daughter, Peggy Sparkman, stated, he went up north to work in, in a foundry in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, because it paid more money than the foundry here. He left in 1940 ahead of his family because he wanted to be sure he had a good job and a place to stay. He applied for a job at the Landon Tool Company, which was a foundry and he started off as a janitor. He then operated a tow motor to carry iron and steel to different departments. He retired from there after 30 years. He won a lawsuit from the company after retirement because of the black lung disease. He didn't live long after the retirement. Photograph 86 is Joe S. Moore. Joe S. Moore migrated to Williamson County from Elkmont, Alabama. He uh, came to Franklin and married a second time uh, Miss Dosha, who lived on Park Street. Uh, James S. Moore made his living by cane bottom chairs. A few years later, his son, Reverend Joe David Moore, came uh, to Franklin. Uh, photograph 87, Mary S. Moore, wife of Reverend Joe David Moore, who both uh, migrated from Alabama. Photograph 88, uh, once again, is Joe S. Moore. He was the father of Reverend Joe David Moore. Photograph 89 is the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, once located on Folk Street. The original proportion of the property was purchased for $700 cash in 1948 by Frank Moore and his wife from the heirs of A.N.C. Williams. Frank Moore and his wife later sold the western portion of their property to uh, his brother, Reverend J.D. Moore, for $1. Frank Moore and his wife sold the eastern portion of their property in 1950 to Reverend L.E. Coleman for the sum of $1 for building of the church shown in these photographs. Pictured is a side view of the Mount Zion Church leading to the dining room in the basement where the church often held socials and community activities. Shown with members of the American Legion Lodge are uh, Robert German was uh, the second from left and the pianist, church pianist Eleanor Bright, 
the other person is unknown. The next photograph, the small child in the buggy, is um, taken at the front entrance of the church, which was for facing Folk Street. Uh, the church was torn down during the neighborhood uh, revitalization during the 1960s, and it was where the old H.G. Hills and the Piggly Wiggly in that vicinity where that stands now. Um, I'd like to note that Reverend L.E. Coleman served as the pastor of the First Missionary Baptist Church uh, at one time. Photograph 90 is uh, Reverend David Lewis Moore, son of Joe David Moore. Uh, photograph 91 is David, Reverend David Lewis Moore. I would like to suggest that you, the viewers, uh, come up and read, uh, and it's more information on some of these photos that uh, I'm uh, not at, uh, able to uh, have in front of me in very interesting uh, stories about the life and times of, of David Lewis Moore during his time in Georgia. A uh, photograph uh, 92 is Dora Ann Moore, who migrated to Texas, and she was the daughter of Reverend Joe David Moore and his wife Mary. Uh, she migrated to Texas. She's a retired educator who returned to Williamson County a few years ago, and she uh, bought land in Thompson Station and had a house built by Reverend Scruggs a few years ago. Photograph 93 is a picture in the background of this photograph is the former Park Street home of uh, the Moore, Reverend Joe David Moore. Now, uh, his father, Joe S. Moore, lived further up on Park Street near the corner of the alley, but Reverend Moore had property down near closer to 11th Avenue, and uh, the house that you see in the background is what he actually built himself. It has since been torn down. But standing left to right in this photograph is Harold Thomas Moore, his son, who was a minister, Reverend Harold Thomas Moore, who was deceased, and, and Harold Thomas' uh, friend, Zach Hodge. Photograph 94 is actually two, two pictures. Uh, Henry Farmer, uh, a Franklin native, who once lived on uh, Columbia Avenue, and Henry Farmer and his brother Charles. And Henry attended Tennessee State University as a young man, and his studies were interrupted when he began faithful service to his country as an instructor for the United States Army during World War II. Soon after his participation in the Army and his return home, he left the South and headed north where he settled in Detroit, Michigan. It was there where Henry began a long su successful career with the D Detroit streets and railways, taking on many positions and promotion before retiring in 1980. His brother Charles, uh, the, uh, his, Charles Farmer was a graduate of Tennessee State University and the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law. Detroit, Michigan in 1947. He was appointed judgeship in Detroit Commons Pleas Court in 1961. He was also elected to the Wayne County Court Circuit Bench 1965. Wayne County Assistant Prosecutor 1949 through 1951 and Director of the United States Department of Labor and Special consultant. Early in his judicial career, he lectured to judges, lawyers, and law students in six African countries as a special consultant for the United States Labor Department. Farmer maintained a home in Michigan as well as a summer home in West Palm Beach, Florida. 
Photograph 95, Claudine Rucker Black, daughter of Robert Rucker Jr. and Margaret McLemore Rucker. She's the wife of John Black, also of Franklin, Tennessee. She was the granddaughter of Robert Rucker Sr., known for the bricking of the Allen Company, which was a foundry, and the Rucker, also known the Rucker Subdivision and Park, was named in his honor. Uh, the couple migrated to South Bend, Indiana in 1966 after she graduated from Tennessee State University. They owned the J&C Shoe Company in South Bend for five years. She was a retired school teacher after 37 years. She always taught kindergarten through sixth grade. She first taught all black students at Linden School. Five years later, the teaching staff was integrated. She taught at Warren Elementary School out in the country in St. Joseph County, Indiana. Photograph 96 is uh, Michael, uh, son of Francis Farmer. Francis married, and we do not uh, have her last name, but Michael is shown at the Johnson Elementary School 1958 dedication with his classmates. Left to right, Brenda Cannon Lucas, Cynthia Cunningham Covington, Thomas Edward Head. Uh, Michael and his mother and his sister Gail migrated to Detroit, Michigan. Photograph 97, the Prince family of Split Log Road. This early family photograph is somewhat faded, but front row left to right is Boyd Prince, Dorothy, Maybell, and an unknown. Second row left to right, Thornton Prince Sr., Alonzo, Fanny, James, Mary, unknown, and Maggie. And earlier, a photograph of Maggie was shown as operator of the Prince Funeral Home. Also, uh, Gertrude and Thornton. The Prince family members migrated to several parts of the country. The family is known nationally and abroad for top honors in Nashville, Tennessee's hot chicken establishment. Prince family members also own the Prince Funeral home once located on the corner of Park Street and 11th Avenue. Photograph 98, Kim Prince, descendant of the Williamson County Prince family, formerly of Split Log Road. Kim migrated to Williamson County, Tennessee as an employee of the Nissan Company. And I spoke with Kim personally and also another employee migrated from California to uh, Franklin, Tennessee, and she discovered was a relative, a cousin of hers that was out in California where she worked, but she had no idea they were related and didn't know it till they migrated to Franklin. And she returned to California in 2013. She started working at Nissan Corporate Communications in March of 2012 and worked there until 2013. Kim states, the, my work in Los Angeles is television production. I'm working on America's Next Top Model with Tyra Banks as assistant supervisor of production management since February 2014. This production took me to Seoul, South Korea for approximately one month. I'm currently working at NBC on special film projects in America's Next Top Model in the spring. My parents, Louis and Martin Prince, both Nashvillians and reside in Columbia, Tennessee. Both retired after 40 years plus working in the school system. My mother is a full-time evangelist. Together they travel the world ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Photograph 99, the Reams family. Yvonne Reams migrated to Williamson County, Tennessee from New York with the Saturn Company. She was employed with General Motors in Tarrytown, New York for 18 years before coming to Tennessee. 
She retired in 1993 after 31 years of employment. Her parents were Joseph Heath and Rosa Chapman Heath of Craven County, North Carolina. Her mother was a Cherokee Indian and her father was a Blackfoot Indian. The family and others received retribution from the United States government in 2007 for lands taken in slavery in North Carolina. Reams and her family are members of the First Missionary Baptist Church in Franklin, Tennessee on Natchez Street. Shown in the photograph are the Reams family, uh, Michael, Isaiah, Yvonne, Keon, and Ebony Reams, and Carlton and Tina Reams. Yvonne was employed by Saturn, whose successful product and approach had altered American automotive history. In 1996, Saturn employed 9,591 employees. A large number of Saturn employees found church homes in other counties, such as Davidson County and Murray County. Some Saturn employees joined local black and white churches with varying denominations. A few of the local black churches were First Missionary Baptist Church, Limestone Missionary Baptist Church, Greater Pleasant View Missionary Baptist Church, Shorter Chapel African Methodist Episcopalian Church, West Harpeth Primitive Baptist Church, and Locust Ridge Primitive Baptist Church. Photograph 100 is Samuel Graham, whose nickname was June. He was born in 1903. He was a native of Darlington, South Carolina. He was the son of Nanny Bull and Samuel Graham Sr. He married Mary Hall in 1925. He is recognized in this exhibit because of two of his granddaughters, Alina Bell, known to us as Lena, a Williamson County School Board member, and, and also uh, Dorena Williamson, wife of Reverend Chris Williamson, pastor of the Strong Tower Church. Uh, they migrated to Williamson County, Tennessee. Uh, their grandfather, Samuel uh, Graham's funeral program noted that he was the statue of kindness, love, respect, and honor. He was known as the second African-American to vote in Darlington, South Carolina. What a legacy for this family to have a grandfather who was the second African-American to vote in that county. Graham's extensive civic duties included organizer of the first NAACP chapter in Darlington, South Carolina, teacher of vocational skills to veterans after World War II, member of the Darlington County Farm Bureau, Justice of the Peace of South Carolina, political leader and activist of South Carolina for more than 50 years and Boy Scout master for over 40 years. His fraternity organizations included Secretary of the Eastbound Masonic Lodge Number no. 147, Sexton of the Eastern Star Morning Star Lodge Number no. 220, and member of the Joint Stock Lodge. Photograph number 101, the Bell family, Gary, Lena, and their four children, Tress, age 13, Chandler, age 11, Avery, age 10, and Grace, Grayson, age 6. Uh, Alina Bell and her husband, Gary Bell, moved to Franklin as newlyweds through a job transfer and to live near family. She states the following, now 18 years later with a family of four children and an active role in shaping our next generation's future, I love to share with others why I have such a passion to serve others. My great-grandfather, Samuel Gilmore Graham, is one of the people who influenced my decision to consider part 
politics as my life's calling. Born in the late 1800s, my papa gave me many gifts over his lifetime. The gift of time, the gifts of resources, and the gift of a beautiful legacy. On my many visits to Dubsville, South Carolina, Darlington County, I recall being given permission to hear grown folks' conversations. Papa would share how he purchased 126 acres of land as soon as it was offered to African Americans after the Great Depression. Picture number 102, Alina Bell, is shown in a local newspaper clipping of newly elected members of the Franklin Special School District being administered the oath of office by Tennessee Supreme Court Justice Connie Clark. Board member Elena Bell was appointed in 2013 to fill a vacant seat, took her oath as an elected board member. Left to right, Connie Clark, Elena Bell, Kevin Townsville, Robin Newman, and Tim Stilling. Photograph number 103, Reverend R.L. Denson, deceased, was a member of the First Missionary Baptist Church on Natchez Street, but he was a Mississippi native who migrated to Chicago and then migrated to Nashville and, and on to Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, on that photograph is a photograph of his wife, Leela. Leela was an asset to the community. Uh, she was named in the Ladies Home Journal as a winner of a, a $10,000 essay contest. She, uh, in this uh, article, it says, uh, after two years of study, she received an associate degree from a local community college. In 1977, Leela was accepted at Chicago's Illinois Institute of Technology but had to get her high school equivalency diploma as well. The community college had never asked her for proof of her high school graduation. It was slow going, but Leela's perseverance worn out and she received her BS in management and accounting three years later with honors. In 1981, she easily passed her CPA exam and took a job at a major accounting firm. Still, the desire to teach never left her, and when the family moved to Nashville in 1987, Leela found a position as an accounting teacher at a small junior college. Uh, she later taught accounting at the Volunteer State Community College in Gallatin while working on her MBA at Tennessee State University. Combining schoolwork and family isn't much easier for Leela than it was 16 years ago. Uh, as she explained in her contest ex essay, my greatest desire is to take a year or two off from work to complete my MBA and begin working toward my doctorate in accounting. I've decided to do it in 1991, 92 come hell or high water. The $10,000 prize, the $10,000 second prize will help Leela accomplish her goal. With her doctorate, she hopes to become the dean of a college business school and finally a university president. I do know that while living here in Franklin, Leela was the office manager for a uh, judge or district attorney here in Williamson County, Tennessee. Photograph number 104, Reverend R.L. Denson. The Saturn plant brought about many jobs for workers within the company as well as jobs made available through contract work from other companies. One search worker was uh, Reverend R.L. Denson 
who was employed as an engineer by the Kenner Metal, uh, a tool and die company. Denson's job kept him operating in and out of the Saturn Company. Denson and his family initially chose to move to Davidson County, Tennessee from Chicago. His family would later live in two Williamson County locations before settling and making their permanent home in Franklin. Photograph 105, Steve McNair, 1973 to 2009. Former Williamson County resident migrated here as a professional athlete. According to a newspaper report, he was a small town boy who made good. Grew up in Mount Olive, Mississippi, a rural town about midway between Jackson and Hattiesburg. He was a Titans NFL quarterback, quarterback in his team to the Super Bowl in 1999 season and earning NFL co-most valuable player honors in 2003. He was well thought of by this community and highly missed. Photograph 106, Joseph White, Tuskegee Airman from Mississippi who married County native, Williamson County native, Katie Kennard. Katie Kennard was a member of a very successful Williamson County uh, family. Uh, all of her siblings were college graduates who most uh, not only had their uh, BA or BS degree, they went on to get their master's or their doctorate degree. And they were the uh, outstanding uh, educated uh, members of uh, Williamson County family. One of uh, their siblings, Houston Kennard, is currently working to do community work and open a business here in Franklin to enhance the community. Photograph 107, wedding day picture of uh, Dr. Joseph White and his wife, Katie White. Uh, photograph 108, wedding day photograph of Ruby Jean Carruthers and Richmond Kennard. Pictured in the receiving line is the bride's father, Ezel Carruthers, and bride Ruby Jean Carruthers Kennard, and maid of honor Ethel Louise Burns Taylor. Photograph 109, wedding day of Ruby Jean Carruthers and Richmond Kennard. The group, the couple migrated to Langston, Oklahoma after the wedding and resided there until retirement. They presently live in Franklin. Ruby Jean is the daughter of the late Ezel and Viola House Carruthers. Richmond is the son of Arthur and Ira Smith Kennard. The wedding took place at the Brooks Memorial Methodist Church, once located in Brentwood, Tennessee, but relocated to Nashville after the construction of Interstate 65. The bride was a graduate of Franklin Training School. She received a BS degree and an MS degree from Tennessee State University and was a candidate for MS degree in Western State College in Bowling Green, Kentucky. The bridegroom was a graduate of Franklin Training School and received his BS and MS degrees from Tennessee State University where he was a member of the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. He was employed as a teacher and director of agriculture. Thank you for joining the 2015 Williamson County Library Thelma Bell's African American exhibit. We hope you, the viewers, will go away having been enhanced with a better understanding of African American history and the migration of African American history. We have only whetted your appetite. This exhibit is a food for thought. There are so many directions that this works in progress can be taken. 
We hope that you, the viewers, would like to join in in this migration experience. For instance, the Saturn employees, the African Americans who migrated here from other states, we would like to hope that the Saturn will join in and start a works in progress on the migration and the history of their employees. We would like to think that the, the Nissan employees would do the same thing. This was only scratched the surface. There's such a wide history of uh, involving African Americans in Williamson County, Tennessee, and we wish that you, the viewers, would take part. And once again, thank you for joining us. Time's getting hard, money's getting skinned. Soon that yellow might come and come, bound to meet his place. Part of the stigma is that people think if I ask for help that I'm showing weakness, whereas I think it's just the opposite. You have to be ready to tell your story, but this generation seems to want to talk about it and it's very therapeutic, so everybody should be given a chance to tell their story. We're taught from day one, recruit, train, and take care of each other, you know, no matter what the condition is. It all comes back to take your strength to swallow your pride and say, I need help, and to go actually get the help. Financial problems started when I was injured at work. There was no money coming in. I had to figure something out quick. We received our letter of default around Christmas time. There's nothing worse than having the fear that you're about to lose your home. The desperation that goes along with that is uh, very intense for just anyone. We did go out to see if we could find some foreclosure prevention companies, but doing the conversation and meeting with them, we found out that the first thing that they wanted up front from us was money before we even filled out the application. There's lots of companies that were offering the services and making a lot of promises to us that they could save our home. I really just didn't feel comfortable with them at all, and I just decided to take another path. There are a lot of companies claiming that they can stop the foreclosure process or help you modify your loan. You should be extremely cautious of people who make any guarantee, ask for money up front, or tell you to make your mortgage payments to them. I called one of the loan modification specialists. They said they could help. They needed a $500 deposit and then $3,000 after that. They said they had attorneys working on their side. They would talk to the mortgage company. They took my money and they didn't do anything for us at all. We were desperate to save our house, and I guess that's why we believed in them. It was just a scam. All of a sudden on a Saturday night, our front doorbell rings. I open the door and there's this lady on our front step talking at the top of her voice saying, you're going into foreclosure, you're going to lose your home. Well, I immediately asked her to leave. I then called my servicer and they didn't know anything about her. Apparently it was a scam. Unfortunately, there are a lot of scam artists out there. Some even look to be affiliated with the government. Their websites have official looking logos and graphics and their names include words like federal. Hope Now connects you with counselors that provide free foreclosure prevention assistance. When I met with the counselor that Hope Now connected me with, I was a little suspicious when I first went in there. I noticed that she didn't ask me for any money. I really felt that there was someone finally here that could help me now. I do believe that Hope Now saved my house. If it wasn't for them, I don't know where I would be. We probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Our counselor was so professional, I was impressed. She looked at our entire situation and helped guide us through the whole process. Everything that she has done was free, no cost to us. Time is of the essence when it comes to the risk of foreclosure. No one can guarantee you can get a loan modification or that they can stop the foreclosure process. But if you are in trouble, the first thing to do is contact your mortgage company and get housing counseling. You can do this by contacting the Homeowners Hope Hotline at 888-995-HOPE. The sooner you call, the sooner you can get peace of mind. It's very scary knowing you could lose your house. You feel like you're all alone in the world. It's hard to know who you can trust, but you can't let that fear lead you down the wrong path with people who might be out to scam you. 
There are real people offering real help, and they're at 888-995-HOPE.